This is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. And now, here is Alex C. All right, here we go. It is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. Um, got a, just a couple of things to go over today. Number one, former Oklahoma quarterback Williams is going to be transferring to play for his former coach at USC. So Oklahoma Sooners quarterback Caleb Williams will be transferring to USC to play for his former coach. And, of course, Lane Kiffin believing that he's won the war in regards to the transfer portals. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Again, I don't think USC is going to be a destination people are going to go to. I don't think USC is all of a sudden going to be a powerhouse. I don't think USC is going to win a national championship. I know there are other people that believe all of a sudden now that they are, but of course those are people who were alums of USC to begin with. So they're going to believe anything and everything because they have nothing but the highest hopes and expectations in the world. But I think their expectations are unrealistic. You can't take a PAC 12 school and all of a sudden make them competitive against the SEC, especially since the SEC has all of the best recruits because they're in all the right areas to get the best players in the country. And they're going to continue to do so. That's not going to stop just because a former SEC coach went over to the Pac-12. Matter of fact, I'll make the argument that he might, for the next couple of years, get a few players over that used to be in the SEC uh, or are sitting on the sidelines and cannot get on the field to be first stringers for the SEC. So he might get a few of those people and he might get some stragglers in years to come for the next three, four or five years, but he's not going to get a top three or four or five recruiting class into USC to make them a powerhouse to be able to contend for the national championship. They'll win the Pac-12 title, uh, you know, and they'll win the Rose Bowl, but they're not going to be a team that's going to be playing in the national championship. The only Pac-12 school that has a shot consistently and constantly in regards to doing that seems to be the University of Oregon. Big donor, big money. Obviously, there were a lot of behind the scenes things happening there that made it to where players had no problem going to play for Oregon, considering it's not necessarily in the greatest location in the country either. But again, they have their rhyme and reasons why they go to these schools. A lot of it has to do with financial stuff under the table, behind closed doors. Now, you don't have to do it under the table or behind closed doors any longer. Oregon has one of the largest donors in the country. It's made it to where they were able to get some of the best coaches and to get that program on the right track. But they're still, even with all the money that they're able to put behind Oregon's football team, not able to be an actual national contender. So if Oregon's not able to do it with all the money in the world, USC's not going to be able to do it just because they got an upgrade in coach. And by the way, Oregon has a coach that is equal to, to USC's coach to begin with. So that is why I do not see USC making a run for the national championship. Pac-12 championship, sure. National championship, probably not. They don't have the resources that Oregon does. And the coaches between Oregon and USC, in all honesty, are pretty even Steven. And you're even Steven in the weakest division in football as far as the NCAA goes in the Pac-12. And Oregon has been the king for quite a while. USC will now be competitive, but they'll be competitive with the Pac-12, not for the national title. Just want to make sure that I clarify that. All right. Meanwhile, moving back over to the NFL, uh, Tom Brady has made it official, by the way, this morning. Tom Brady has now made it official. He is now officially retiring. So now the argument where all these people were trying to you know, back their friends who said that Tom Brady was retiring. And then Tom Brady went on his podcast and says, I'll know when I know no official word from Tom Brady. And then everybody was speculating saying, should these guys have been out on the airwaves saying that Tom Brady was going to retire. And then there was this big debate and big argument going back and forth saying, well, you know, they said Tom Brady was going to retire, but they didn't say it was happening when they just said he's going to retire. It could be next month, next week. It could be in the next couple of days. It could be in the next couple of years which is really kind of dumb. Let me just weigh in on that really quickly. For the guys who were sitting there trying to back and support their guys who went out on the story early saying that Tom Brady was going to retire, and then all of a sudden it looks like, well, is he really going to retire? Nobody really knows. Tom Brady, no word, being silent, being really cryptic, all of a sudden goes on his podcast, still being really cryptic. And then the argument starts to be, should these guys have ever said a word about Tom Brady actually retiring? 
And then it's, well, why not? I mean, he's going to retire next week, next month. Look, that's stupid. That's weak. If you go out in front of a story and say that somebody's going to retire, you're not jumping out in front of the story and saying that because you are trying to just be out in front of it two years from now or two months from now. You are not trying to do that. When you try and say it's something like Tom Brady's retiring, you're trying to say it because you believe it's going to come out. You have sources and you think that you need to get out in front of it now because you want to be the first to report it so that you can continue, you know, to have the nice job that you have and to do what you love to do, which is reporting and breaking stories. And you want to be the first every chance possible to break the story. So when they were saying Tom Brady was going to retire, they weren't saying Tom Brady was going to retire predicated on the fact that he might be announcing it five years from now, two years from now, or two months from now. That's stupid. That's a weak argument. To listen to these guys this morning have this debate and conversation talking about, well, these guys didn't say anything wrong, didn't do anything wrong. They never said that Tom Brady said he was going to retire right now. They were talking about it's going to happen eventually. You know, it could be two years, could be two months, could be two weeks, could be five years. You don't know because they didn't put a timeline on it. That's absolutely stupid. They went out on a limb saying it because they wanted to be the first ones to say it because they believed that Tom Brady was actually, in fact, going to retire right here, right now this offseason. It's amazing to watch these sports guys act like politicians trying to be friends to these guys who went out in front and it looked for a moment that they might have got it wrong by announcing that Tom Brady retired. Obviously, they did not. Tom Brady officially announced it now, so it is set in stone. It's done. But when nobody seemed to think that it was actually going to happen anytime soon, then they try to backtrack it by saying, oh, no, two weeks, two months, five years. They didn't say when. So they weren't wrong when they said that Tom Brady's going to retire. That was absolutely pathetic to listen to. And it was stupid to listen to. When reporters go out in front of a story and try to say that they know something, they're not talking about five years from now, five months from now, two days from now. They're talking about right here, right now, because they're trying to be the first to break the story. That was the most ridiculous debate I had ever heard this morning. And it was just dumb. All right. Staying with the NFL, uh, all 32 teams obviously have assets to help improve their team in free agency and the 2022 draft. Um, Let's go through all of them, starting with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, The Jaguars have had the NFL's worst record over the past two seasons at 4-29. and So right now, they have consecutive number one overall picks, a position that puts them at the top of the rest of the rounds as well. They also have an extra pick in the third round and the league's second highest total of cap space to build around in 2021. Uh, The New York Jets. Trades that shipped out safety Jamal Adams in 2020 and quarterback Sam Darnold in 21 and tight end Chris Herndon in 21 have left the Jets with four picks in the first two rounds and six in the first four rounds of the 22 draft. The Broncos. The Broncos have extra picks in the second and third rounds thanks to the midseason trade that sent linebacker Von Miller to the Rams to go along with their own position at number nine in the overall draft order. The Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles have three first-round picks thanks to two 2021 trades. One came via the deal that sent quarterback Carson Wentz to the Colts, and the other was from the Dolphins for trading down six spots in the 2021 first round. The L.A. Chargers. Now, the Chargers' big advantage is their cap space, which is at the moment topped only by the Dolphins and the Jaguars. Now, quarterback Justin Herbert isn't eligible for a contract extension yet, but the Chargers should already be planning ahead for that because obviously they're going to have to pay him some money. He's worth money. He's not as good as everybody says he is, but he is above average and he is worth some money. The Houston Texans, a team that needs a lot of help. Uh, they have current cap space of $20.7 million, and the Texans have the number three overall pick and should have an extra selection in the third round after trading cornerback Bradley Roby to the Saints. Number seven, the Baltimore Ravens. In addition to having the number 14 position in the draft, the Ravens received an extra third round pick after the Texans hired former assistant coach David Coley as their head coach. And they also, by the way, have $12.7 million in cap space. Uh, The New York Giants. The Giants have the most draft capital, but one of the worst cap situations. 
at least at the moment in the NFL, their 21 draft day trade with the Bears netted an extra 2022 first round pick. In the ninth position, we have the Detroit Lions. Now, the Lions have a current cap space of $26.2 million. The Lions will continue to cash in on the 21 trade that sent quarterback Matthew Stafford to the Rams this year with an additional first round pick, and they'll have a pick at each end of the first round. The number 10 position belongs to the Cleveland Browns. Look, they got a cap space of 29.4 million. The Browns have five picks in the first round and 29.4 million in cap space. Washington, 37.5 million in cap space. Washington has the number 11 overall pick, but at the moment, only six selections in the 22 draft. The Raiders, their current cap space, 31.7 million. The Raiders don't pick until the second half of the first round, and they don't have any extra picks in the top four rounds. New general manager Dave Ziegler and coach Josh McDaniels won't start off at a deficit but they also won't have a massive set of resources to remake the team. Atlanta Falcons, uh, they're minus 3.4 million. They're in a little bit of hurt. Falcons will have to determine how far under the cap they can get before regulating their offseason ambitions. The Pittsburgh Steelers in the number 14 position, their current cap space, $37.5 million. Now the Steelers have the number 20 overall selection, but they traded away their own picks in the fourth and fifth rounds. They should get a compensatory pick in the fourth round, according to over the cap. Now, the Tennessee Titans, good team, not a lot of needs, current cap space, only $2.7 million. The Titans won't pick until late in the first round, and they traded away their second round pick for receiver Julio Jones. Number 16, the Cincinnati Bengals, $48.6 $48.6 million for their cap space. The Bengals aren't draft efficient, but they're scheduled to pick near the end of every round without any projected compensatory picks. Number 17, you have the Minnesota Vikings in a world of hurt, negative $10.4 million. Former general manager Rick Spielman habitually collected lower round picks accounting for the Vikings' larger draft AV, but new general manager Kwasi Adolfo Mensah, and I don't believe I said his name correctly, sorry about that, has some decisions to make regarding the cap space. The New England Patriots, $16.5 million in cap space. Remember, last year they spent a lot of money. The Patriots have their top four picks, but over the cap doesn't project them to get a compensatory pick after their free agent spree last offseason. Number 19, the Buffalo Bills, $4.8 million. The Bills have their top six picks in the draft, but they choose late in day one and also will have to figure out a way to clear some cap space because with only $4.8 million, let's face it, folks, that's not a lot of money. Number 20, the Seattle Seahawks, $45.3 million in cap space. The Seahawks are flush with cap space, obviously with $45.3 million, even with quarterback Russell Wilson set to account for $37 million this year and could begin addressing an extension for receiver DK Metcalf, among others. Carolina Panthers, $22.5 million. The Panthers traded away their second and fourth round picks as part of the deal to bring in quarterback Sam Darnold, and their third round pick will go to the Jaguars as part of the trade to acquire cornerback C.J. Henderson. Number 22, the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins have the NFL's third lowest draft capital at 665 million. Hello money. Uh, They traded away their own first and third round picks, but the highest amount of cap space is available for them again with $66.5 million. Green Bay Packers, world of hurt, lots of problems. They are minus $45.8 million. No cap space. They are in trouble. This ranking mostly illustrates that the Packers have some work to do with quarterback Aaron Rodgers, which is no surprise. His 2021 contract restructure elevated his 22 cap number to 46.1 million, a number that can't be lowered by an extension or a trade. Number 24, the Indianapolis Colts. They have a current cap space of 41.2 
$1.5 million. The Colts gave their first round pick to the Eagles as part of the trade to acquire quarterback Carson Wentz, who was also set to cost $28.2 million against their 22 cap. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, it's interesting. I'm wondering what's going to happen with Tom Brady now leaving. What does that do to their cap space? I'm not really sure. Right now, their current cap space is $10.3 million. The Buccaneers' offseason will be wild. They'll have to deal with the cap ramifications, again, because of Tom Brady's pending retirement, which is now official, which could ultimately free up some 22 space. But they'll also need to find another quarterback and decide what to do with their slew of pending free agents. The Arizona Cardinals, only $11.2 million in cap space. The Cardinals have five of their own draft picks, but over the cap projects them to get three more compensatory selections. Number 27, you have the Dallas Cowboys. The Cowboys are minus $17.7 million in cap space. Uh, the Cowboys have a lot of established veterans with high cap numbers, including receiver Amari Cooper at $22 million and defensive end Demarcus Lawrence at $27 million. Could they be on their way out? And will the Cowboys need to restructure quarterback Dak Prescott's deal? I would imagine they're probably going to approach Dak Prescott and see if they can restructure his deal. The Kansas City Chiefs. $12 million in current cap space. The Chiefs have the number 30 overall selection, but traded away their own picks in the fifth and the sixth rounds. They'll have to manage their cap space carefully as contracts expire for key players, such as safety Tyron Matthew, left tackle Orlando Brown Jr., and cornerback Chavarius Ward. Number 29, the Chicago Bears. They have $29.7 million, a brand new general manager, a brand new coach, and Ryan Poles has a limited draft capital to work with, obviously, at least at the moment after predecessor Ryan Pace sent the team's first and fourth round picks to the Giants last year to help the Bears draft quarterback Justin Fields. Uh, they're projecting them to get compensatory picks, or I should say they're projecting them to not get any compensatory picks, so it's going to be tough sledding for the Chicago Bears, but again, cap space not bad at $29.7 million. The New Orleans Saints, $69.4 million in cap space. The Saints have by far the worst cap situation in the NFL, and that's without having an obvious starting quarterback on their roster. Taysom Hill has a $12.3 million cap number, but his fate is in the hands of the team's next coach, which is yet to be determined. We don't know who that's going to be. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers, they're negative $255,000 right now. Uh, the 49ers made a thrilling run to the NFC Championship game, obviously, but now they'll have to reckon with an offseason that will provide limited options for further elevating their roster. They sent their first-round pick to the Dolphins last year as part of the deal to draft quarterback Trey Lance. And the L.A. Rams, negative $3.3 million, the team that's going to the Super Bowl to represent the NFC. The Rams went all in once again, and it led to a Super Bowl berth. They traded away their 22 first, and second, and third round picks for quarterback Matthew Stafford and linebacker Von Miller. It's unlikely that anyone in the Rams organization has second thoughts, however, and we'll have to see how that plays out in two weeks when we're looking at them facing the Cincinnati Bengals in the Super Bowl. Um, let's see here. 2022 NFL free agency rankings. Now, let's go over these really quickly. Um, these are, we talked about cap space. We talked about teams. We talked about needs. We talked about where they're drafting. Let's talk about some of the free agent wide receivers that are out there. Number one being Devonte Adams. Adams made it clear. He wanted to become the highest paid player at the wide receiver position. And it's hard to argue against him deserving that distinction. Number 20, number two, I don't know why I just almost said number 22. Number two, Chris Goodwin, Godwin. God, can I speak English today? Godwin and the Buccaneers were unable to come to an agreement on a multi-year deal after he was franchise tagged last offseason, but that very well may work out in Godwin's favor this upcoming offseason. Mike Williams, number three. Williams picked a great season to finally break out and become a consistent player with his 55 receptions through week 13, already eclipsing his full season career high of 49. Allen Robinson, the second. Robinson has endured a disastrous 21 season as he once again tries to produce in a passing offense that ranks dead last in yards per game. Robinson has seen just 50 targets through week 13 after commanding 113 targets through week 13 of 2020. Number four, Michael Gallup. Gallup's contract year got off a bit 
shaky as he sustained an injury in week one that kept him sidelined through week nine. Uh, he's caught five passes in each of his past three games, though. So Michael Gallup, number five on the market for uh, wide receivers. Number six, Antonio Brown. I don't know if I agree with him being a number six. Even at 33 years old and after missing time here and there, Brown is still one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. Through five contests to start the season, he put together three outings with at least 90 receiving yards and a touchdown. Odell Beckham Jr., yes, he is going to be a free agent this year. The Rams' final midseason addition of 21, Beckham Jr. didn't take too long to get acclimated to the West Coast. He had his first 40-plus yard reception since week two of 2020 in just his second game with the Rams. Juju Smith-Schuster. Smith Schuster turned down offers from the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs to stay with the Steelers, who selected him in the second round of the 2017 NFL draft. Smith Schuster was once believed to be supplanting Antonio Brown as the best wide receiver in Pittsburgh, but even with Brown no longer in town, that still isn't the case. Christian Kirk. He is going to be a free agent with the Arizona Cardinals this year. Uh, Kirk has lined up in the slot in over 77% of his snaps so far in 21 season, trouncing his previous career high of 41.6%. He has a similar career trajectory to Washington football team wide receiver Curtis Samuel. Number 10, DJ Chark Jr. Chark's relationship with new head coach Urban Meyer didn't get off to its best start. As Meyer said, he was a big guy that played little in a wide receiver room devoid of top-end talent. Number 11, Will Fuller. A suspension to close out the 2020 season was likely a factor in Fuller signing a one-year $10 million flyer with the Miami Dolphins for the 2021 campaign. As is the case with everything this season in Miami, Fuller's year has not gone as planned. Uh, Jamison Crowder, number 12. Crowder agreed to a rather substantial pay cut before the 2021 season to stay with the Jets, and his 62 receiving grade through week 12 is just the hair above his career low now in his seventh NFL season. Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Valdez-Scantling hopes to be one of the next late round pick undrafted free agent speedsters to cash in big in free agency this year, uh, much like Tyrell Williams did with the Las Vegas Raiders and Robbie Anderson did with the Carolina Panthers. Sammy Watkins. Watkins may be on his third team in as many seasons, finishing the 21 season lower on the depth chart than where he started. His 394 receiving yards this year marks the lowest total of his career. Cedric Wilson. Coming in at number 16. No, sorry, number 15. Braxton Berrios coming in at number 16. Colleen Cole, number 17. A.J. Green at number 18. Those are your top 18 free agent wide receivers that are going to be available in the offseason for 2022. Look, this is going to be a big offseason for a lot of reasons. Jimmy Garoppolo, where is he going to go? Is he going to you know, stay in San Francisco? Obviously, most people think not. Uh, I got my thoughts on that. I'll probably talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Uh, and you, there's just so many things get, that are going to happen. You got a lot of coaching hires still, uh, decisions to be made in that regard, still decisions to be made in regards to general managers as well. Um, as the news comes out, we'll go through it together. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. You guys enjoy the rest of your afternoon.